we are turning the corner and embarking on a path that's going to be an entirely different life than the the momentum toward uh, stillness, disease, decline, and um, the, the sadness of losing your capabilities because you you know you watch this happen for ten, twenty, thirty years. Welcome back to another episode of the Peak Performance Life Podcast. Today, I am very excited to have one of my favorite guests back on again. His name is Brad Kearns. He's 58 years old and he is in amazing shape. Uh, if you see the picture on his website and, and obviously if you're watching him on YouTube right now, you can see just in great physical fitness. He's a New York Times bestselling author, a Guinness World Record setting professional speed golfer, number one USA ranked masters age 55 to 59 track and field high jumper in 2020 and former national champion and number three world ranked professional triathlete. He's written 20 books on diet, health, peak performance, ancestral living. He's a popular speaker, retreat host. He's the face of the Primal Blueprint online multimedia educational courses. And he was the co-author of the smash hit in 2017, The Keto Reset Diet, which became a New York Times best seller and briefly ranked as the number one overall best-selling book on amazon.com. Brad, thank you so much for joining us here again today. I know. It's great to reconnect to Laura, and um, we'll have to make it a regular occurrence. We covered some interesting topics last time, and there's so much to talk about. You referenced my age out of the gate, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's right. I'm 58 years old. I, I forget sometimes, but um, I used to uh, throw around that uh, that familiar tagline, hey, um, age is just a number. I, I feel great on my birthday. So, And then um, I, I heard someone challenge that one time, and I never forgot the little quip. And uh, the person said, you know, age is not just a number, and you better frickin' respect your age and start doing something about it instead of jabbering about, about how it's just a number as you age at an, in an accelerated rate which is what we're seeing in today's modern life, to the extent that it's so prevalent and so commonplace that we perceive aging inaccurately now. And we think that, you know, you hit these landmarks like 40 or 50 or 60, and, you know, you switch from playing flag football with your buddies on the weekend in your 20s, and then you're playing uh, uh, pickleball, and then you're playing golf in a cart with uh, cigars, potato chips, and pretzels. <laughs> and, you know, then pretty soon you're just uh, watching other people perform on television. And I want to reject all those notions and uh, look at some of the shining examples of people who have, you know, battled aging with incredible grace and, uh, you know, still performing at their peak. And also importantly, you know, having that edge, that competitive edge mixed into your life throughout your life, because everyone can reference back in the day when I played quarterback, uh, you know, I was supposed to go to play D1, but then I hurt my shoulder. You know, everyone has that time where they were in their athletic peak performance zone, or, or most people do. Uh, and then they kind of just remember it and tell stories about it instead of realizing like right now i'm just an old guy i like doing the old guy track meets i'm no longer racing on the professional circuit and uh, having the uh, interviewed by espn and people cheering for me and making it a big deal like i like i thought it was when i was racing for for my career but I still have that same intensity and it means so much to me to pursue a goal and strive for it and struggle and overcome it and, and achieve something that means a lot to me. So I think wherever we are in life, even if we're not a competitive type person, you can go and challenge yourself and say, you know, this summer I'm going to climb to the, the top of the peak with my cousin who invited me and I'm going to practice for it every day as I go to the gym and think about some goal that's daunting and challenging and then get you, you know, uh, focused, motivated, out of bed, going through the process and enjoying it every step of the way. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And that's why I'm, I'm so happy to have you back on too, because you're an inspiration for me. You're a role model for myself and many others. Uh, uh, and, and yeah, absolutely. To your point, I, I recently started playing indoor soccer again. I'm 42. So, um, you know, and, uh, so I started playing indoor soccer again and it just feels amazing to be competitive and to, and to be out there playing a game. And, you know, and people were telling me like, Oh, aren't you afraid you're going to get hurt? And it's like, you know, like you can't, I get it. You don't want to get hurt, but you also just can't 
not do anything because if you don't use it, you lose it, right? So I'd rather yeah. I'd rather take the take the slight risk, um, you know, but uh, but give it a shot. And uh, and it's been so much fun. Uh, I really enjoyed it. That's a good uh, topic to discuss about uh, the the injury risk. And what I'm realizing now at this age is that you can't get away with anything that we did back in the day. So you can't race into the parking lot at 5.48 p.m. and your game starts at 6 and you get out there and touch your toes three times and, and do some strides and then all of a sudden you're, you're guarding somebody and stealing the ball and planting on that uh, right knee when the quad's not activated yet. So this morning I just did a sprint workout and um, it's great to be back on the track because I've been battling injuries. Uh, but the, the sequence that precedes uh, an important workout for me takes almost an hour and it's mm. kind of um, a chore at times to go through my morning sequence and I have an online course I talk about it at bradkerns.com you can uh, see what I do and learn a nice morning exercise sequence for yourself but I do this uh, sequence of exercises every single day and then when I'm finished with that then I'm ready for a proper formal workout because I'm, you know, gone through the mobility, strengthening, flexibility exercises, and cool downs important, uh, extensive warm ups important, and you realize all the elite athletes do this to a great extent, and <laughs> they still get injured, but they're taking care of their bodies, unlike that weekend warrior who's trying to squeeze things in without enough time. Um, Mark Bell on the Power Project podcast, good friend of mine in Sacramento. He he was uh, going through his um, you know his extreme devotion to fitness, and he says, you know, all in. If you add up everything that's supporting and related to my fitness, it takes me about four hours a day. And the listener's going, what? You know, mm. I barely have thirty minutes to squeeze in between my busy family life, career, and all that. But right. he's talking about meal prep, shopping at the farmer's market instead of uh, just you know un f microwaving some processed food. Um, all the all the you know the prehab, the rehab, the foam rolling in the evening when you're relaxing, watching TV. And if you if you find it you know distasteful to commit time and energy to your fitness and your health, then we have a real problem to talk about because the the penalty is severe. Uh, and on the other side, the payoff for taking care of your body, you're sailing through life and you're escaping from the stuff I mentioned earlier, which is the accelerated decline and increased disease risk that's coming from a modern society that is disregarding their health in every possible way. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I've also seen firsthand um, you know, once my father stopped playing tennis, how much his everything kind of deteriorated when, when, it, when he wasn't when he wasn't active, when he wasn't able to be active enough to play the sport that he loved his whole life. And now he's pretty much just not very mobile sitting in front of a TV most of the day. It's and he's not used to that. He's used to be and and, and you can just see his, you know, his mind is not it's mm. kind of deteriorating faster. Things are just so for me, man, I want to stay active as long as possible. And so so as you know, as you get older, right, there are transitions uh, that you need to make. Mm. I think you, we, you know, we were just briefly touching on before the recording how you mentioned there's some different um, mindsets and reflections that you've been going through now uh, in your in your later ages. What, what are some of those changes and, and different mindsets? that you're taking on? Well, I think one of them I, I just mentioned about how it's such a privilege to be able to uh, use your body and uh, avoid injuries. And it's completely taken for granted when we're young. I'm not thinking about um, the potential injury risk. I'm just thinking about kicking butt in the adult basketball league or, you know, putting in huge miles and seeing if I can, you know, uh, uh, get up the next day and do the same thing. And so now it's like when you do have some setbacks that are uh, possibly age related or, you know, an overuse pattern that you didn't properly pay attention to, even though you knew it was there and nagging you. Then you get the news like I just had a uh, uh, heel surgery last year and um, they said, yeah, you're not going to be running for three to six months. And I'm like, yeah, right. I can, you know, I'll rehab from this in a couple of weeks and I'll be back out there. Well, um, at the six month mark, I'm finally free from, you know, the pain and the post exercise soreness that I was dealing with and going to physical therapy and working very hard to get out of this rut. But if I had just uh, gone under the knife and then sat around and watched TV, it would be a lifelong 
uh, nagging to severe problem because I didn't rehab the crap out of it. So the, you know, the payoff is there, uh, but you do have to be patient and you have to dedicate that time. But I will say one thing about time is that it does not take much time to be fit or even super fit in life. And the reason is because you can take a very short duration period and challenge your muscles to near maximum, to failure, and you will get a tremendous fitness response. So I think we've been socialized to believe in the fitness industry that you have to join a gym, uh, get in line to punch your uh, your card, uh, and then go find a space. And, um, you know, the teacher teaches you for a very grueling one-hour class, and then you're supposed to come back and do it again the next day and the next day. And a lot of people get exhausted and burnt out because they're, the traditional approach to fitness is too stressful. And what yeah. we, you know, what I've been trying to do with um, the message that I'm spreading is like fitness can be immersed into all aspects of life such that if you're sitting at a uh, at a desk in a desk type job, you can take a two minute break and start pulling on the, the, the stretch tubing or simply do a set of air squats right there in your cubicle. If you have no room and no supplies, when you do 20 deep squats, you're starting to burn. No, even if you're a fit person, you can get your body to uh, that, that, that level of difficulty where the muscles are really challenged in one or two minutes. And you can sprinkle that in a few times a day, and then we'll talk 365 days later, and it will ma- have a massive improvement in your overall fitness conditioning level and your enjoyment of the actual formal workouts or soccer matches or whatever it is that you're doing. But we need to sprinkle in these micro workouts throughout our busy day and avoid these prolonged periods of stillness which cause all kinds of problems, musculoskeletally and just diminished, uh, you know, metabolism and all these things that then when it is time to go take off our sweats and go into the soccer game, we're shuffling around and we don't feel fit anymore because we're dealing with a week of 168 hours and 160 of them are sedentary. And then, you know, we're moving around for a very minimal time uh, during our daily life. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, for most people that are overweight, I would probably say that if they literally just for people who are sedentary and overweight, obviously diet will we'll, we'll touch on as well. But so for many people just walking at a fast pace for 30, 30 to 60 minutes a day, um, you know, could make, they could shed pounds like crazy, have more energy, feel better, right? Just so, something simple like that, right? Where like good for your mental health, good for your physical health, just go, going for a walk as fast as you can if you can't do anything else, right? Obviously, I think, you know, strength training, weight training is important. We've we've kind of discussed that um, as well in, in many previous podcasts. But, but like you said, it can't just be, um, and, and the other thing, like you said, the recovery, right? So, you know, I used to be able to lift weights, you know, six days a week for two hours each time or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. now it's like, you know, after you know, four days a week, I find is, is typically, you know, is typically my Mac, you know, typically the max where, where otherwise I'm feeling beat up or tired or whatever. Right. So I'm, I'm also, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm trying to balance everything. I want, I want to, I want to get good workouts and I want to be in good physical shape. I also don't want to destroy myself. If I finish, mm-hmm. if I come finish a workout and I come back and all I can do is sit on the couch and and I'm not productive the rest of the day or or not feeling good, that's not good either. So I'm I'm also playing this balancing act. Oh my gosh! And you know, for those listening where this is relevant, it's a huge deal. And I I you know I, I battle that all the time because I'm so enthusiastic and I've been an athlete my whole life. And I have a tendency to overdo it at times. And then I learn those hard lessons where I'm kind of spaced out in the afternoon because, you know, the the mind and the body work together. And, you know, devoting excess energy to to working out is a good way to dig yourself a hole. And then in many cases, become discouraged and have this experience of attrition that we see in the fitness industry. So um, the, the idea here is, you know, baby steps every day. And now I'll speak to the other side of the equation where we have a lot of momentum against us to even be able to live a basically fit lifestyle. And so for those people who are discouraged and on the sideline now, I can see this very clearly. I have family, friends, loved ones in this category where, um, 
they don't feel great. They don't have a lot of energy. They're not in good connection with their body. They don't appreciate their body. And so there's all this momentum stacked against them, keeping them stuck in a lifestyle of inactivity. And when you're inactive and you don't manufacture energy well internally, you are going to be reaching for the processed foods that are fueling modern humans. And this stuff creates a very vicious cycle of messing with your metabolism further so that you have less energy, so you don't feel like taking that 30-minute walk that Talor recommends, and instead will reach for the ice cream to you know keep alert because your fat metabolism and all these things are screwed up. So the way to extricate yourself from this hole is to take a tiny step forward every day that's doable, reasonable, sustainable, and say to yourself, I'm going to spend the first five minutes of my day leashing up my dog and walking one lap around the block and coming back and preparing something that's nutritious to start my day with a bowl of fruit or whatever. And those small changes as number one best-selling book, Atomic Habits, James Clear, a lot of people are familiar. He emphasizes this tremendously that you have to start with a really low bar so that you can actually succeed rather than get discouraged once again because you bought a 12-pack from a hardcore personal trainer on January 1st and you finished in April and you were exhausted, sore, and your shoulder hurt and you you know ended up the rest of the year uh, you know back in the same rut. So I'm really a fan of like baby steps steps and just just little tiny changes but of course with the perspective that we are turning the corner and embarking on a path that's going to be an entirely different life than the the momentum toward uh, stillness disease decline and um, the, the sadness of losing your capabilities because you you know you watch this happen for 10 20 30 years yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so I want to I want to switch gears a little bit. I want to ask you a little bit. I'm sure people are probably curious about your routine. So uh, would love to hear about um, your workout. Like what's what's a typical workout week uh, look look for look like for you? And then then I'd love to also hear later on. I'd like to talk a little bit about some hacks. Uh, you know, whatever supplements you're taking and and the kind of the way that you're eating and things like that as well. Oh, thanks. Yeah, um, it's. Uh... It's a lot of these things to me are second nature. So I'd, I'd rather um, present this in a way that, you know, can be of most relevance to the listener and mm -hmm. see what works for you and um, what feels, you know, comfortable and sustainable. And so taking care of your energy and your motivation and your positive attitude, I think, is paramount. So if there's anything that, you're doing right now that feels like a chore, a struggle, or your negative self-talk is, oh, I got to go, you know, meet the running group again. These guys really pound. They're, they're, they're way too fast for me, but uh, uh, I'll try. Mm. You know, those kind of things are a recipe for disaster. So uh, whatever I'm doing, it's something that I figured out that I really enjoy and fits conveniently into my lifestyle. So I bring up this example of the morning exercise routine, which for me is really amazing that it's been life-changing because I've of course, been a lifelong athlete and I love my workouts and I don't have trouble getting motivated. But I decided uh, this is now um, six years ago that I should start my day with some form of mobility flexibility routine because what was happening is I was doing my awesome sprint workouts once a week and then I'd be sore for three days after and aching because nothing I did during the week approximated the challenge of what I did at my most uh, challenging workouts. So I said, what if I, you know, woke up every day and did some hamstring drills and some balancing and some uh, yoga and some dynamic stretching and things that just got my body into more functional mode. And that was my starting point for the rest of the day, whether I did a workout or not. Some days that's all I would do would just be my morning sequence and then super busy getting onto an airplane, traveling, whatever, that's it. But I changed my life because now I could count on myself self every single morning i knew what i was doing i was not reaching for my mobile device which is what 84 percent of americans do the first act upon awakening is reaching for the mobile device and then we have behavior psychologists and other experts contend that as soon as you reach for the device you switch your brain into the 
uh, fight or flight reactive mode because you are engaging with what's called uh, intermittent variable rewards. And these are dopamine stimulating novel uh, messages from your text messages, from your social media feed, things that light you up and engage you in a reactive manner. And so you're extricating from this high level thinking, reasoning, strategic planning, uh, a state of gratitude, um, you know, a calm meditative state to start your day. And that is very difficult to extricate from is what the experts say. So once you're on with your device, you're locked into that mode throughout your busy, hectic, multitasking day. So instead, I have I have implemented this into habit that I get out of bed and I immediately hit the deck and I start in with my hamstring kickouts and my leg swings and all the things that you can see uh, on the video where I, where I demonstrate. And I started out with something that was pretty modest. Uh, it took about 12 minutes. It wasn't that hard. I was just swinging my legs back and forth. But over the past six years, it's been such a rewarding and uh, beneficial experience that I've started to add things into the mix. And so now I do the exact same thing every day, which is really important for habit forming. So I'm not kicking into my creative energy. I just go and I do uh, 40 kickouts on the right leg, 40 kickouts on the left, 20 leg swings forward, 20 leg swings backward, 20 scissors forward, uh, mountain climbers on onto the next, onto the next, onto the next. And that's where I don't have to, um, I don't have to worry about whether I'm motivated or whether I feel like it. I just do it every single day. Now the routine is quite, uh, it's quite impressive. It's not easy. It's easy for me because I do it every single day, but it's, it's a pretty good workout if you watch the whole thing and it takes a minimum of 40 minutes and then I will often kick into a formal workout, which I can tell you about a few of my favorite ones. But I want to emphasize the point that I started at 12 minutes. If you only have five minutes and you're not super athletic, let's make a five minute commitment to leash up the dog and walk around the block. Or if you don't have a dog, walk around the block and look at the cute dogs in your neighborhood and make that a habit by committing and making it very important to you that you start your day in a proactive manner, doing something that you advocate for your own personal health and well-being. And then guess what happens if you can achieve this goal is you become a more focused, disciplined, and resilient person in general to all other forms of stress that you face and, and potential distraction that you face throughout the day. So that's my huge plug for a morning movement routine. The features are get outside into direct light. You can listen to Huberman Lab podcasts and uh, many uh, hours of content about how important it is for direct light to hit that uh, super chiasmatic nucleus and go into your hypothalamus and set your circadian rhythm. So first thing in the morning, our job as humans are to get outdoors. If it's minus 12, um, uh, get outdoors for a minute or two and then go back into the warmth. But when I do it, when it's, uh, you know, snowy weather in Lake Tahoe, I just have the slider open and yes, it's pretty cold, but I'm doing this very uh, strenuous sequence of exercises. So I'm still not getting cold and I get cold after, and then I close the door. So morning exercise routine, number one. And then when it comes to uh, a, a diet, if you're asking me about a typical day, um, I've made a, a massive switch in the last couple of years away from a template of fasting and all those great benefits and all the things that I've written about where, uh, you know, I fast until midday and have a nutritious meal. Now I make a concerted effort to start my day with a huge bowl of fresh fruit and a huge high protein smoothie with creatine and uh, many other agents and uh, pills and supplements going in there along with uh, good sources of fat, good sources of uh, carbohydrates from the frozen fruit. And so I'm eating this huge meal every single morning. And that's been great for me because I'm an active athletic person and I want to get maximum cellular energy status at all times rather than throw fasting into the mix as well as throw in my high performance workouts into the mix. Because as we know from um, you know, basic biological uh, uh, insight that fasting is a stressor to the cells as is exercise. And when you stress the cells and challenge your cells to perform better, you achieve or you experience a, a health benefit. But when you start stacking all the different stressors in your life, that's when we have the potential to overdo it. 
And in our game where we have the, the, the biohacker and the extreme health enthusiasts, like I live and breathe this stuff. So yes, I'm into cold plunging. I'm into doing sprint workouts. I'm into fasting. I'm into ketogenic diet. Uh, all these things are all writing on the same side of the scoreboard, the stress side. And then, okay, what do you do to take care of yourself? Oh, I, I try to get a lot of sleep. And it's easy to get out of balance. And so now, because I'm at a a uh, healthy body composition, my blood work looks good, and I want to be an a as active and energetic as possible, I'm subscribing to this uh, ideal of eat more and move more. And that's, I think, a great breakthrough in progressive health circles because I don't want to, you know, uh, uh, dis fasting and keto and all these things that I've written about and recommended and people have had great benefits because they are tremendously beneficial to help you extricate from a lifestyle of overeating, uh, especially processed food. If you make any change to that, you know, standard American diet pattern, you're going to have a ma massive health awakening. But I choose to direct all my stress resources to performing athletically and recovering. And so my new mantra to Laura is perform, recover, perform, recover, perform, recover. And that's how I believe I am going to promote maximum health span, maximum longevity. I like, that's very interesting. You know, it, I've been seeing this trend a lot and I, I, it's been kind of the same with myself as well. Um, you know, I think, I think intermittent fasting, it's proven it's a great way to lose weight. So for, you know, for people who are, who are overweight and, and maybe not as active, um, but there's definitely been this trend and I'm, I'm feeling the same way to, you know, obviously when you sleep all night, you're not taking in any protein, then you go another, you know, however many hours in your, in your intermittent fasting without taking in any, any protein. Mm -hmm. If you're an active person who's, you know, strength training and, and doing all these, you know, physically fit and active, um, your body, it's kind of hard in, in two meals a day. I mean, even if you consumed, if you consumed 40 grams of protein per meal and, and you only ate two meals a day, you know, you're at 80 grams of protein where, you know, for me, I'm 180, 80 pounds or so. Uh, and it's like, you know, people are telling me I should hit, try to be hitting 150, which is, which is even hard for me to do in three meals. Uh, you know, it's hard enough to get there in three meals, right? If I'm doing 40 grams of protein a meal. So is, is introducing your morning uh, protein smoothie and fruits, uh, is that to, to also try to take in more protein to help your muscles recover? And then I'm also curious about the fruit because fruit has been, obviously you've written about, you know, the keto reset diet. We've, you know, a lot of, there's been, fruit's been kind of controversial over the years, right? Is it, it's, it's not going to keep you in ketosis, but then, you know, there's fiber, there's vitamins, there's all sorts of other stuff. So, so I'd love to hear about, you know, your protein intake and, and your opinion on fruit. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, w what's happened is um, carbohydrates have been uh, savagely uh, attacked for 20 years as the, you know, the source of um, destroying our health. And in many ways, that's true because we have so many processed carbohydrates and that's where all the high profit, low nutrition foods are. And so, you know, the modern human eats, you know, massively more carbohydrates than our genetic expectations for health and all that stuff. But somehow we've grouped uh, natural, nutritious, easy to digest carbs together with the, um, the, the loaves of bread and the, you know, the onslaught of uh, the, the various grain foods that um, serve to overwhelm the system. So um, as some of our leaders like Ben Greenfield and Kate Shanahan have pointed out, um, even Peter Tia has said this many times, like um, there's nothing inherently evil about um a carbohydrate ingestion and an insulin spike unless it overwhelms the body and brings the body out of homeostasis. So if a modern human who doesn't burn enough energy and eats too many processed foods is in this energy toxicity state, that's a term from Dr. Lane Norton, I love that term, energy mm -hmm. toxicity is the overwhelming, the overarching problem of modern life. It means not burning enough energy and um, you know consuming too many calories. So we need to uh, address that first and foremost. Maybe you'll do it by fasting. Maybe you'll do it by uh, restricting fat from the diet for a while. Maybe you'll do it by restricting carbs from the diet and you'll have great success because you are limiting your choices and your options and your eating window and all those things. But these are merely strategies to achieve hopefully a short-term goal of getting rid of excess body fat and getting your metabolism working again. 
so now we're going to have another reflection of, um, you know, we want the body to be active, energetic, and uh, in a peak performance state. And so we need all manner of fuel sources for different reasons. We have the essential fats that are so good for hormone production and um, you know cellular health. And then we have the carbohydrates, which are burned for energy. Um, I'm also uh, appreciative of the carnivore movement and the leaders like Dr. Sean Baker, Dr. Paul Saladino saying, hey, you know what? Some of this uh, plant life that we are highly regarding as the most healthy diet you can get as a plant-based diet and these big salads and these kale smoothies, they are potentially problematic because of the natural toxins, especially when consumed in raw form, such that that kale smoothie uh, should really be considered literally as a small dose of, dose of poison that prompts a beneficial antioxidant response in the body. But guess what? I go back to my mantra of perform and recover. I don't need to poison myself with a kale smoothie when I'm doing some sprints on the track, which also prompt, they they prompt damage and then they prompt a beneficial antioxidant, anti-inflammatory compensatory response to get fitter. So there are some uh, concerns about eating the high toxin plant foods uh, in the in the vegetable family, and that's why fruit becomes such a superstar that deserves to be brought back to center stage. Is because these are very low in toxin concerns and very high in antioxidant phytonutrient benefits and fiber and water content. They're easy to digest, so they are peak performance food. Uh, right there with the um, the highly regarded, most nutrient-dense animal foods on the planet. So I'm kind of on this meat and fruit kick now as my dietary centerpieces. And most notably, um, out of the restriction st- strategy, restriction meaning restricting your time window, restricting your choice of macronutrients, restricting the volume of carbohydrates for a particular strategy, like trying to get into ketosis. And in many cases... The people with the most metabolic damage will benefit the most from these highly restrictive diets because they have to fine tune their insulin sensitivity again. So going keto can be a fantastic health awakening. And as you mentioned on my bio, Mark Sisson and I wrote the best-selling book, The Keto Reset Diet. And luckily, we had the foresight to realize the big picture even back then at the start of the keto movement that we recommended a six-week sequence of going keto, enjoying all those health benefits, and then recalibrating and going forward with a dietary strategy that works best for all your goals and concerns and and lifestyle uh, factors. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and yeah, I'm, I mean, I feel much better. Um, you know, I, I was kind of a proponent as well of the keto diet. I mean, I'm, I'm always, I've always been paleo ever since, uh, you know, 10 years ago now, I had the massive pain and inflammation all throughout my arms, couldn't type for a couple of years, had to use a voice Oof. dictation software. So I, I went through the inflammation and and uh, went to every doctor, had MRIs, chiropractors, you name it. Uh, in the end of the day, I was eating lots of inflammatory foods. I was eating French fries. Mm. I was eating, you know, I was drinking a, a yerba mate iced tea from Whole Foods that I thought was healthy and without reading the label and seeing that there was 20 grams of sugar and I'm drinking two bottles a day. And so so that was the biggest game changer for me was, was going paleo and lowering my sugar intake eliminating fried foods, eliminating breads, pasta, mm. grains, all, all those kind of things. And then, um, and, and to this day, I would say I'm still probably, I would say on average, I'm probably somewhere around a hundred grams of carbs per day. Um, but, uh, so I, I guess it's still probably considered lower carb, I would say, but, uh, I do feel, you know, I don't, I don't feel great when I eat super heavy carbs, but fruits is different. I love, I love a fruit smoothie as well. And, uh, I think having a, having a fruit smoothie protein shake, um, you know, is, is definitely a great way to, to, to take in more protein, try to hit your protein numbers, get the fruits in as well. A uh, little bit of healthy carbohydrates there, but yeah, I'm, I'm trying to always just keep lower inflammation in my body. And, and that's why I'm avoiding chi- kind of anything that could cause inflammation. Like you said, like raw kale and things like that, you know, can be inflammatory. Um, so, so yeah, those are kind of, I kind of subscribe to, to a similar thing as well. So yeah, good point. And you, you asked about protein too. Um, yeah. I love the, um, the recent energy toward, uh, this uh, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon calls it uh, protein or, or muscle centric medicine. 
and realizing that the number one uh, attribute to promote longevity and avoiding uh, disease risks is to maintain functional muscle strength throughout life, as well as cardiovascular fitness. And so that entails doing some aerobic exercise and entails doing regular strength training. And to build muscle and to maintain it, you need to have sufficient protein. And so protein uh, becomes the central focus of the diet. And this is nothing new. I mean, there have been best-selling books going back to um, uh, Michael and Mary Eads. And, uh, you know, the, the protein has been uh, highly regarded as a way to, to lose weight because it's highly satiating. It's not burned for calories. So if you eat a bunch of protein... Um, it's, it's a way to stay satisfied when you're trying to uh, drop excess body fat. But clearly, it's the most urgent dietary need and should be the centerpiece, the central goal of anyone's eating strategy is to get sufficient protein to allow the muscles to repair, recover, and of course, support every all manner of uh, general body function. Um, now, here's the... Um, another insight that I want to throw in here, uh, because a lot of times we get confused. You might have somebody on the podcast next week talking about, uh, you can't eat too much. You, you should watch your protein intake. And then the week after you're going to have someone saying, I need to, you know, overstack that protein so you can get the beneficial response. And so, um, there's this, uh, this concept with our health where we, might want to distinguish between what's possible and what's optimal. So when I was researching the uh, the, the keto reset diet book and and living it, uh, you know, and living and breathing it every day and pricking my finger, uh, you know, twelve times a day and charting everything with all the meals and and learning what it was all about. Um, I was able to fast for uh, routinely 24 hours, 36 hours, and then have a meal that was between, you know, zero and 12 grams of carbohydrates, and then fast for another eight hours. And all that stuff was fine because I was metabolically healthy and I adapted to it. But it might not have been optimal when I was still trying to go out there and put in a good track workout. So I had some of these crash and burn experiences in my past where I was fooling with fasting, time-restricted eating, carb restriction, and trying to lift weights, get out there and pedal my bicycle and put in some aerobic, go to the track and do something that was really strenuous, and it caused me to crash and burn. And so then you pick up the pieces and say, all right, well, you know, where do I stand on, on this level, on that level? And I think to avoid the controversy and make it simple and have some great takeaways for everyone, the first thing we need to address before we talk about anything else is to eliminate processed foods from your diet. Um, it's not fortunate what happened to you, but fortunately your experience was so extreme that there is no turning back to a, a mild inflammatory lifestyle for Talor. You had to go out of escape that shit so you could get your mm -hmm. hands back so you could type. Um, most people are just lingering along for years and decades with minor health conditions that even you go to the doctor now and they say you're fine because you're normal and you're in the quote unquote normal range compared to a bunch of sorry asses. And so I don't want to be normal about anything and I don't want to hear words like fine or normal. I want to be exceptional and superior and do anything possible to, to reach that goal. And so the first thing to do is clean up your act and get that stuff out of your life, out of your home. And unfortunately, when we dine out, most entrees, at all manner of restaurants, from fast food to middle chain restaurants to you know even fine dining, they're using seed oils routinely to prepare their meals. And so you're getting a major dose of the most offensive, inflammatory, and health-destructive food of the refined industrial seed oils when you dine out. Chipotle, hey, we're sustainable. We get local everything. Look at our mission statement. They cook their food in rice bran oil. Um, I had an argument at P.F. Chang's in your hood of Las Vegas. I went out there and I said, can, you, uh, can we order the Brussels sprouts and can you please cook them in butter? And the guy said, I don't think so, man. I go, well, how about you go in the kitchen and check? Because I'll bet you there's a stick of butter in this giant restaurant with life-size horse statues. And he comes back and he goes, I'm sorry, we can't do it. And so I was so bent, you know, I, I hit up corporate because, of course, this is my hobby, this stuff. And I wrote them a long, thoughtful letter uh, and they didn't answer. And so then that's when you really get me going. If I take the time to write you a nice letter to help your chain restaurant succeed and you don't even have the 
you know, the, 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 the will to answer me back, that's when I'm not going to give up. And so finally I got a hold of somebody and I think um, their gesture was to offer me a $25 gift certificate to P.F. Chang's. And I'm like, what, so I can order more seed oil laid in Brussels sprouts? I go, right. no, nah, I don't think so, man. Just, I want to know, email me back when you decide to change your policy. And the restaurants do this for cost savings. So they are knowingly harming customers' health to save a few bucks. Even at my son worked at one of the best steakhouses in Los Angeles, hundred dollar steaks, and they're back in the um, back in the kitchen making the sauce with seed oil, and they don't care. No one cared, and so yeah. protect yourself, clean up your diet, and then we can open up the discussion to, hey, how many carbs should I, you know, should I go to to this level or that level? None of this matters if you're ingesting uh, poisons and toxic foods. So that's my that's my starting point for the discussion. Then we can talk about, you know, getting moving uh, more throughout the day and increasing all forms of general everyday movement, which I'm going to rank above a fitness program. Of course, a fitness program is great. Mm. We want to get you in there, working on the machines, doing something simple, uh, working on your balance, working on your cardio. But the number one goal, as Mark Sisson calls it, JFW, just effing walk more in your daily life. we got to get moving. And if so if you clean up your diet and get moving in general, then you have a chance to have the energy and the motivation to go and pursue more advanced fitness goals. Yeah, yeah, and I, I totally agree. It's it's so unfortunate. It makes it so hard to eat out with all these restaurants using the seed oils. Even True Food Kitchens only last year got rid of all their canola oil and started only using olive oil, and and uh, I think that's what they mainly use there as well. Um, which was a huge relief to me. I when I when I heard because when I, we asked one, I I usually ask. I usually ask, you know, what oil is this cooked in when I go out to eat? Uh, it's my daughter's always embarrassed when I ask that question. <laughs> She's like, Dad, come on, stop messing with these waiters all the time and uh but it's like you know listen i want to know what i'm putting in my body i'd rather not eat at all i'd rather skip the meal and sit here and order mm. nothing if if i'm just going to be eating a, a, a something that's going to make me more inflamed and you know drain my energy and all that kind of stuff so yeah it is important to ask it is important to, to look at the back of the labels right even salad dressings have seed oils in the salad dressing most of them um you know and and people are cooking with it so yeah certainly certainly taking a look at that um is 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 really really important. I know I know we're kind of wrapping up towards the end to, uh, here, but I did want to ask you real quick. I want to ask you what are what are maybe two of your go to meals uh, in a week? You know, besides this besides a smoothie, I assume you're probably having two more meals per day uh, aside from the smoothie. And then also favorite the go to supplements, favorite supplements. And I know you also sell supplements, so obviously I want to uh, some supplements and some other products. I I was on Amazon looking for a macadamia nut butter, and there, you know, lo and behold, I find uh, B Rad's macadamia nut butter, uh, and I bought it. I loved it. So um, right. so yeah, so a couple of go to meals and and go to supplements for you. Thanks. You know, I've, I've uh, become more simplified with my meal prep and I, I enjoy eating and cooking and preparing meals, but I just love uh, ground beef so much that I'll make giant bowls of it. Uh, sometimes I'll, uh, um, you know, jazz it up with some, uh, some onions and some sun-dried tomatoes and a lot of flavoring and spices, uh, but I'll just eat a, a ton of that. And sometimes I enjoy putting things on there like uh, sourdough bread that I'll, I'll fry and, and uh, butter up really nicely and fry in a pan or, or corn tortillas or things that are, you know, generally uh, not on the list of, you know, the, the, the paleo strategy, but I'm enjoying my life and I'm enjoying the, the centerpiece of having a lot of uh, ground grass-fed beef or bison, uh, ground lamb. Um, I will I will um, puree uh, liver into that because I'm not a huge fan of eating big old slabs of liver, but I know how important it is to get into my diet. So it'll be this uh, huge uh, pan fried. Um, creation that I can go to and hit for numerous other meals. I put a lot of sweet potatoes in there uh, besides my giant bowl of fruit in the morning and my giant protein smoothie. So we're talking about the, you know, the staple foods. Um, I go to butcher box and get most of my meat that I consume. And so I like to uh, load up on their grass-fed ribeye and their grass-fed beef and bison. 
And so I guess it's not that exotic, um, but I'm a, a huge proponent of having red meat at the centerpiece of the diet, interestingly enough, because a lot of people tout, well, I, I eat a lot of chicken and fish and uh, I, I'm cutting back on red meat. Oh, good for you. You're so healthy. But now we realize that the, uh, the, the, the micronutrient profile of red meat is vastly superior to chicken, pork, and turkey because of the ways that the animals are raised. And even if they're uh, if they're conventionally raised, it's especially so because the cow fares much better with the nasty grain diet than does the chicken or the pig or the turkey. And so mm. red meat uh, deserves to be brought back as a dietary centerpiece along with, uh, along with fruit. So I'm eating a lot of those and, of course, a lot of pasture-raised eggs. And I think you know, I get great feedback from listeners uh, and people that read our books. And uh, a lot of people remind us that, hey, you hotshots, a lot of people are on a budget and we're trying to do the best we can, but don't be telling me to buy only grass-fed beef because it's too expensive. Okay, okay. So what is the best return on investment value for a true uh, nutritional superfood? I'm going to put pasture-raised eggs up there. I'm going to put canned sardines and other oily cold water fish up there. So you can do an extremely winning diet on an extremely low budget such that anyone who's got an internet connection is listening to the show. I'm going to say you can afford to eat in a supreme manner. Don't ever say that budget is, uh, uh, you know, a uh, uh, a sticking point. And there was a great post on Mark's Daily Apple years ago where someone put in the price of um, pizza delivery, uh, stopping for Starbucks, you know, uh, grabbing uh, a snack at the gas station. And at the end of the month, it's $367. And then on the other side is like, farmer's market, uh, three pounds of produce and fruit and uh, fresh stuff uh, for, you know, less money eating completely clean and healthy. So that was amusing. And it's making good choices and keeping things simple, doable, sustainable. So I think I mentioned most of my go-tos there. And um, I have a product called uh, B-Rad Whey Protein and Creatine Super Fuel. And so it's a whey protein of the very best quality with creatine infused in there because I think everyone can benefit greatly from supplementing with creatine. So that's the centerpiece of my smoothie. But I'll also make this smoothie with bone broth, which is a great source of collagen and other agents that are hard to get in the diet. Real bone broth. Um, mm -hmm. That's the liquid source. A whole bunch of frozen fruit of different kinds. Uh, a few scoops of the protein with the creatine. And then I'll throw in a bunch of ancestral supplements capsules, including the product that I promote called MOFO, uh, male optimization formula with organs. So those are some good product plugs for everybody. And I'm always playing around, as you are too, I'm sure, with uh, different recommended supplements. I'll have a consultation with an expert. I'll try this. I'll try that. But I'd rather people focus on, you know, the big picture ones. And I think, you know, like you said, probably the most sensible supplement is a protein, a high quality protein supplement. And let's put all the plant-based proteins in a different category because I'm going to argue strongly that those aren't as high quality or as easy to digest and assimilate as whey protein, which is widely regarded as the gold standard. So an animal-based protein. But if you can easily get your protein needs met in your diet, even if you're running around like crazy and don't have time to sit down and prepare a beautiful omelet, that's going to make you feel better. It's going to make your muscles perform and recover better. And it's also going to help stabilize your appetite and your satiety hormones so that you don't experience these spin outs in the evening where you killed the entire pint of ice cream, um, which is you know, it's your bot when your body's appetite is dysregulated, it's just a way of telling that you're depleted, overstressed, overbooked, and you know, striving to get back to energy balance. Yeah. Well, awesome, man. Yeah, I, I really, I agree. I think whey protein and creatine for anyone who's doing strength training is uh, is definitely a, a big thing that that pretty much everyone should be taking. Most men, at least, uh, and and probably many women as well. Most women as well. Um, but so, Brad, this has been awesome. Where can people? I know you have you have online courses. You have nutrition and training and and all sorts of stuff. Where can people uh, best find you and follow you? Yeah, thanks, Talor. Bradkearns.com is a lot of fun to go check out that website. You can see me doing crazy videos of this stuff like speed golf. Uh, there's a bunch of free ebooks that you can get that'll help you navigate uh, different specific uh, topics that you might want to learn more about. And then I host the Be Rad podcast, and I would uh, love for people to enjoy some of the content there. I have a mix of 
great interviews with experts as well as uh, short breather shows where I give you some quick hot tips that you can take away and learn right away about a morning exercise routine or about optimizing testosterone naturally or cleaning up your diet. So um, love to connect with everybody and we read everything that we receive and we answer everybody. We try to build this community just like you're doing a great job with the um, one of my favorite terms, peak performance, man. Peak performance Thank in life. You. What more can you ask for? Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Brad. Uh, you're an inspiration for me. Uh, you know, when I'm 58 years old, I want to be as active and physically fit as you. Uh, so thank you for being an inspiration to me and many others. And uh, everyone uh, go follow Brad and, and uh, I'm sure we'll do this again soon. Thank you. I'd love to, Talor. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, can you please leave us a rating or review and subscribe? I've realized that while we have actually increased our downloads a lot, we're actually getting a lot of downloads, which I'm really happy about. We actually have very few ratings. So, and I realized that I've never asked people really to rate much. So I'm asking you now, if you could please rate and review and subscribe. And if you enjoyed the episode, please forward it along to anyone that you think will get value out of this. Also, if you haven't checked out our line of products at buypeakperformance.com, you get 20% off your first order. That's www.buybypeakperformance.com. Com. We have some incredible products, including our organic high altitude coffee. If you don't know this, coffee is one of the most heavily sprayed with pesticides out of any crop. So it's really important that you drink organic coffee. We've gone above and beyond to source what we believe is the highest quality and healthiest organic coffee in the world. We're also famous for our organic green superfood powder. You can get 20% off of that as well at buypeakperformance.com. We also have an organic vegan and paleo plant protein. See, most of the vegan proteins out there are using brown rice protein, which is really not a good source of protein, and it's also a grain. And if you're paleo, you know that grains tend to cause inflammation in some cases for some people. And so we wanted to make one that was paleo-friendly and vegan and organic. We made an amazing amino acid profile, so it's really one of the best plant proteins for muscle building. So you can check out Peak Performance Organic Plant Protein. You can find that on our website. Of course, all our products are on Amazon as well. So thanks again. And again, please, if you enjoyed the episode, please forward it along to someone who you feel can get value out of it. And please leave us a rating, review, and subscribe. Thank you.